Uh, this, station, th th this session is state of the shell, so this will be mostly from um, the PMs from the PowerShell team. Uh, so I just want to start off by very sincerely saying thank you for being here. Thank you if it's your first year. Thank you if you've been here for many years. Thank you if you're a speaker. Uh, this event and all of the PowerShell conferences and conference events are super, super important to PowerShell development. So thank you very much for taking the time out of your calendar to be here, to be curious, to be thinking about ways that you can improve your skill set and your career. Um, this is a, a big, big area of, of passion for those of us on the team. And so I just wanted to open by saying thank you. Um, I want to kind of paint the picture of what uh, the, our team culture is like. You're going to meet all of the PowerShell PMs. Actually, Sydney's not here yet. She'll be here this afternoon. And uh, we all love Sydney very much. So. Um, we can't wait for her to get here, but uh, this is kind of the thing that we repeat to ourselves at the beginning of every time we present. We won't, you won't see it in every one of our sessions, but every time that we do uh, something like a state of the shell, and that is, what are we trying to accomplish as the PowerShell team? Um, and so, literally, it's to improve the lives of people working in operations. And every time I say that, somebody goes, what about developers? <laughs> and my, my argument is, developers also work in operations, whether they know it or not. And so for a while, we tried saying improve the lives of people working on operations tasks, and that really didn't flow. So we just usually say, uh, you know, if we're deciding we're going to prioritize something, one of the first things we should think about is what's the impact? Is that actually improving people's lives? Whose lives is it improving? Is it people who are working on things like IT operations? And if so, this is probably something we should take a closer look at. Um, so hopefully that means something to you that, you know, as we think about what's important to us, it really is beyond all of the things you're going to see that are features we're working on and new things we want to release and what we did last year. We're going to talk about all of that today. This is kind of the underlying foundation that, that drives the passion in our team. One thing we really wanted to make sure that you feel confident in is that PowerShell is still worth your time and a place where you want to spend time and energy um, and continue growing. So yes, absolutely, this is an area where we're still making a lot of investment. Uh, on the left-hand side, this is on our public dashboard. If you go to github.com slash PowerShell slash PowerShell and scroll down, you'll find our public-facing telemetry that we share. This is like the, um, the, the uh, distribution channel environment variable that's documented. You can go look at how this gets collected and how it gets published, but we share it so that you can see that it's generic or genericized and uh, made available. Um, we are now seeing over 2 billion sessions opened per month, and that's only where uh, telemetry is turned on. So a lot of places don't have telemetry turned on. That means there's way more than that actually happening, but this is what we look at to see that, yes, we're still growing. We still see continued growth, more people using PowerShell, uh, the number of nodes and that growth is also on the website, so you can get a feel from that. Uh, but yes, this is an area that's still growing. Also, Microsoft is continuing to see more and more uh, services, especially cloud services, use PowerShell as part of their experience. So you'll see some uh, discussions this week of things like Azure Machine Configuration. Um, you'll see things like uh, continued growth in Azure Automation. Those are heavily, heavily using PowerShell. Uh, if you take a look at Windows Admin Center, and I'll tell you a trick, go turn on transcription and then do some stuff in Windows Admin Center, and you'll see that transcription log just go because like everything happening under the scenes in Windows Admin Center is PowerShell. And that probably rings a bell if you've been using this for a while. You remember that you know, with Exchange, you would see, here's what I'm about to run, here's the script that's going to, you, know, you can do that instead. And we also saw that in several other tools. Uh, with Admin Center, they don't show you the script. But almost everything that's happening in Admin Center under the hood is just running PowerShell. Um, so that was really an, an, a really, really cool thing to see develop. We're still seeing growth in Cloud Shell. Um, and obviously, you can use PowerShell in all kinds of places like running deployments, uh, running functions, doing builds, obviously within uh, things like virtual machines. And so the one thing I wanted to share as we look at that graph, uh, we are intentionally going to mess with our numbers because we're seeing so much growth out of some of the Azure services influencing our numbers that we're probably going to, we're, we're thinking about this and we're going to discuss it at the next community call and kind of get your feedback. But we're thinking about actually saying, 
hey, if some of these services have grown up so much and they've got very consistent growth with PowerShell, let's just stop collecting telemetry out of those services and focus more on the, the, the scenarios where we've got more growth yet to go. So that's one of the things the next community call we'll probably talk about and uh, try to come to a decision together with you. Um, so if you, I brought that up so that if you don't attend the community call and you happen to go look at the graph and you say, well, why did it go from 2 billion <laughs> down to like 500,000 or something? It's not because everyone stopped using PowerShell. It's because we're thinking about with the community uh, how we can tweak these things and actually get a little bit deeper understanding of how things are growing without collecting unnecessary data and doing lots of filtering and stuff like that. So for the next part of this session, uh, we're gonna focus mostly on just doing demos. And I don't think this group is gonna be too mad about that. Um, this is a list we put together of what we shipped over the last year. If you see us walking around in the white shirts we had made, I happened to see my son walking down the hall uh, at our house last year and he runs track, or he did last year, and he had all of his track events on the back of his shirt. I'm like, that'd be a really cool team shirt. So everything that we shipped for the last year, we turned into a track shirt that we wear to events. That might be an idea you can use for your team. Um, across this list, we're really proud of what we accomplished, and uh, we're gonna go through the things that are in bold here and actually show a quick, like 30 second to one minute demo of what is that thing. We know that there's a ton of people here who are brand new to PowerShell. And so just saying we did a thing is not all that meaningful. It doesn't help you understand there might be sessions about those things that you wanna go deeply explore. Um, so we're gonna just do these really quick demos and kind of explain what's what. So I'm gonna kick it off and then I will hand it off to Steven. Steven will hand it off to Jason. Jason will hand it off to Danny. Danny will hand it off to Damien. Uh, the PS resource get one, Steven is gonna do for Sydney. But this afternoon, I think, there is actually, yeah, there, there is a PS resource get session by Sydney. If you haven't met Sydney yet, she is wonderful. So I highly, highly encourage um, that session. So I'm gonna start. And um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was how many people here so far have used PowerShell, let's just say seven in general. Awesome. Here's my one question. How about 7.5 preview experimentation? This is something we're always interested in. That's awesome too. Uh, 7.4 shipped. The number one question that we hear is when are you gonna put seven in Windows? Uh, so, yep, everybody does. <laughs> it has been heard. Um, so the, and you probably have heard this answer, but if you haven't, uh, the thing that we're trying to figure out is 7 is built on .NET Core. .NET Core is not in Windows. .NET Core's support lifecycle is uh, shorter. Windows support lifecycle is 10 years. If we put .NET Core in Windows, it means we've got to keep it up to date over that 10 year lifecycle, and we're trying to figure out how to navigate this. Um, what we're thinking right now is find every way conceivable to make it trivial to install when you want it. Um, and, we're, and then we're looking at what are our options after that, um, where we actually try to go all the way to fruition and, and have it be available in Windows. Because I think the, the first part of it is, if I open Terminal, I just want it to be there. I don't want to have to mess around with the install. The second part is, uh, for, in many cases, for enterprises, they try to limit how much software they're installing other than what's been like, vetted through the security team. And so having another thing is another headache. And I'm very much familiar with um, going through having to deal with rules and regulations. So, And one thing I'll just add to that too is um, we'd love to talk to you about the you know PowerShell 7 inbox. We are hosting a number of focus group sessions. Uh, they're on the schedule. We have one tomorrow specifically on PowerShell 7 inbox. So. Uh, Definitely would love to hear your feedback around that and how we can make it work better for you. So Perfect. Yeah. Um, you can run this one if you want to, and then I'll just, just leave it with you. But uh, I just wanted to do like winget install Microsoft.PowerShell. It's already installed, so it's just going to go, meh. You've already <laughs> got it. Um, so we are partnering very, very closely. We might want to turn up the font size. Yeah, yeah you got it. Um, we're partnering very, very closely with the winget oh, team for all kinds of projects. But this is, yeah, that works too. <laughs> um, it's just Microsoft.PowerShell. And just to have a backup in case we lost Wi-Fi, I saved it into downloads, but you shouldn't need that part. Um, so the, the installation process is documented within the Winget installer. Uh, we want to make that script sort of ubiquitous that anybody can use it. 
This is one of the first ways that we're thinking about, let's just make it trivial to go install. Uh, we also are working very, very closely with the Windows Terminal team and thinking about how do you have that first use experience in Windows Terminal where you want to select PowerShell, it's not installed yet, it says, oh, you said you want 7, how about I just install that for you? So we're, net, we're, we're kind of going through and exploring all kinds of areas. None of that's a, like exactly the answer you wanted, but I wanted, to know, I wanted you to know that we have heard this as the highest priority thing that we should go solve. And like you said, we've got a, a session specifically on this. So take it away on predictors. Cool. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'll just intro myself. My name is Steven Booker. I am part of the PowerShell team here. I work uh, primarily on the interactive uh, enhancements to the PowerShell experience. And I have a session later this afternoon of, about that, so I'll plug that to really dive deeper into how you can enhance your shell so that the shell can help you out. Um, but I just wanted to, you know, um, show off briefly some predictive IntelliSense stuff. Who's heard of predictive IntelliSense? Who uses it on the daily? Show of hands. Okay, a lot of people use it. So um, that's, you know, simply put, predictive IntelliSense is that kind of grayed out uh, prediction that is trying to help assist me based on what I've previously typed. It's a great way for accelerating your shell experience and also it is fantastic for demos because you're definitely, you know, with live demos, it's always stressful to make sure you type the exact right commands. So it's very easy for, for, for demos and presentations here. But um, I'll be talking a lot more about that uh, in this afternoon session, so definitely check it out. Um, I am going to also talk a little bit about some private gallery work that we've been doing. Um, so. PS Resource Get GA this year, which we're all very, very excited about. Um, Sydney did a great job working with that and, and launching that this past fall. Um, and one thing that we have just shipped that uh, we're really excited about, I think it was even, what, last week that the uh, latest release came out, that we now support ACR, Azure Container Registry, um, as a repository for PS Resource Get. And so um, what I'll do here is I'll just show a brief demo. You'll see here I have a ACR instance where I just have a module published to this um, container registry here, and this is in on the local machine. I'll jump back to the VM here, and if I do first, let's do get PS resource repository. You'll see that the ACR demo is registered already, um, and then all I can do is you know find PS resource my module and it will find it within the ACR demo. So if you have uh, scenarios where you want to keep the packages that you want to um, distribute private and specific to your organization, this is a great, great solution for this. Um, and if you want to dive more and deep to this uh, concept, we'll have a session dedicated solely to this concept. I believe it's later this week. Yep. Um, we'll have all the times of the different sessions that you can kind of check out uh, at the end of this presentation, but um, yeah, I think that's it. Anything I... I'll show real quick. Uh, so on the container registry concept, um, this is one of... Oops, sorry. I should go to... And boy, you never know whenever MSN news comes up in the background on when you're presenting exactly what's going to be presented. Um, <laughs> this was an area where our team kind of took some risks. So everybody who sees this for the first time goes, oh, so I can install containers using PowerShell? That's not what this is. For a long time now, people have asked us, how do I host something like the PowerShell gallery in my data center and make it available to my peers? And then how would I do governance of that and all of the things? So when we started talking to this team, they were just beginning their exploration of, what if we put general purpose supply chain artifacts in container registries, not just containers? And we said, we are on board. Like, then you can do uh, authentication using your Entra, aka Azure AD accounts. You're going to get conditional access to them. Uh, if, you, if you get a chance to go play around, by the way, I'm using the Azure example here, but Amazon has one of these, Google has one of these, VMware has one of these. Like you can host these on-prem uh, using your own tools. But yeah, if you go to tools like um, GeoReplication is a cool one, click of a button, you can control which parts of the world this thing gets replicated to and whether or not it supports availability zones and things like that. You can have web, books, uh, web hooks fire whenever you do a publish operation. You can have Defender do scanning. We're still working out exactly what they're scanning, so don't, I don't know for sure if they're going to pick up what's inside the modules, but we're talking to them and saying, can you scan us too, not just containers? Um, this connected registry concept is one we're working with them on so that uh, you would also be able to run a replica in your data center 
that is caching what gets requested to the um, uh, instance that's in the cloud. And so now, you know, after your first request, it's always within your data center, uh, but the same things still work. So you're still authenticating, you can still control group access using your Entra IDs. And this list just like keeps going. Uh, the final part of this that we're still working on, we, didn't, we weren't able to get done for the conference, uh, is to put the AZ module in the Microsoft Artifact Registry, which is an, uh, a public facing anonymous access instance of a container registry. So that gives us what we've wanted for a long time, which is this total separation of where things live. So now uh, we can have Microsoft developed and fully trust, like our first actual first trusted source uh, for PowerShell get and PS resource get as the Microsoft Artifact Registry. And then we can have a community gallery that everybody can contribute to that's, you know, that's more open. And then you can also have a private gallery that's just for your enterprise and that has governance and that kind of stuff. And we're actually still working on uh, on the client side, having things like group policy and DSC and Intune be able to control which registries are allowed at the client side across the organization. So this is like a big, big area of investment for us. We're super excited. So definitely go to Sydney's session. <laughs> She'll walk you through all the details. And who's up next? Is it Jason? Uh, it's Jason. Yep. All right. All of our sessions at the end, we should just say, if you liked the session, my name is Michael Green. I appreciate your feedback. If you didn't like the session, my name is Jason Helmick. Please leave feedback. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate that. Um, so, folks, one of the things that we did last year is we shipped a new version of Crescendo. And for those of you who don't know, Crescendo is a, a framework that allows you to, well, essentially, easily, I stepped away from the microphone, to easily um, take a, wrap a native command so that it looks, smells, tastes just like a PowerShell command. Like it produces structured output, all that kind of neat stuff. It's a really neat, quick way to, to do those things. Well, we released a new version of it, and I wanted to show you one of the features that we added to it with one of the problems I was having. I, I don't know if you guys use Docker. We were talking about Docker this morning, but so passing environment variables to a container, it's not that the, it's, it's terrible or anything, it's just you got dash E, dash E, or, or E and V, and you have to keep doing it over and over and over again for every one that you want to do. And if you want to do this programmatically, it's a little bit more challenging. So one of the new features that we added to Crescendo is argument uh, transformations. And so let me show you an example of an argument transformation, because this doesn't look very PowerShell-y, but I wrapped um, Docker uh, using Crescendo, so I've got start docker run, and notice I've got an environment um, parameter now, and instead of doing dash e, dash e, dash e, dash e, uh, all I do is I just give it the environment variables as a hash table. And here's the thing, I'm gonna show you this in a second, because you all can go home with this too, it's absolutely free. The argument transformer just takes care of all of it for me, so when I run this, my container will start up, theoretically, there we go, let me do a dir e and v. Now I put in some silly, easily identifiable uh, variables, but you can see that they, they got passed, so it all worked down here. Yay, it worked really nice, all that kind of good stuff. And also, just to, in case you were interested, this container, by the way, is, is what I use for work. So I, I, was, I wanted to show you something. I don't dirty up my local shell very much, because I mean, we're experimenting with stuff constantly, and that stuff doesn't you know work sometimes and all of that. So I use this container. Um, and it has all the modules I need and everything that I do for both my local work and for all of the stuff I need to do in, in Azure. The best part about this container is that it, I never have to update it. I don't know if you guys work, how much do you work with Azure? Because you are always updating your tools in Azure. Well, see this, this already is always up to date. So all I have to do is run it and I can use it. And, by, and, and it also has local access, to, I don't know why you're giving me a problem with that now, but it does have local, there it goes, it has local access um, to my system and to my networking services, and there's no timeout on this, so I can use this all day long and then destroy it or restart it the next day. So if you want to know more about that container, come to my session on uh, Cloud Shell. Uh, me and Steven Judd are going to be cranking out some Cloud Shell goodness, and along the way, this container is the Cloud Shell container. You can have it for you can have it locally as your shell, and it's free, so it's kind of nifty. Um, 
Anyways, uh, last thing is, let me exit out of my container. So we do have a dock up. I don't have the link up here on the slide or anything, but what's new in Crescendo 1.1? Um, it goes through the different features. One thing that I'll point out is that the lead engineer on this is Jim Truer. He's one of the original PowerShell developers along with Jeffrey Snover and Bruce Payette that invented PowerShell. He's gonna stop by on Thursday and if you'd like to sit down and talk to him about Crescendo or about anything in PowerShell, because he is kind of well, literally a legend in PowerShell because he's been here the entire time, um, you might want to even, you know, just to sit down and chat with him. It's a great opportunity. This is the last year he's going to be with us. He's going to retire. So this is a great time to see Jim while you still can. Um, and this argument, transfer, uh, uh, argument transformation, if you come down here, you can go to transform arguments in Crescendo. And the example that we have in here for Docker is the example that I just used. So you have the documentation, everything you need. Cool? Outstanding. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Danny Martins. I'm another one of the PMs on the PowerShell team. Uh, I actually don't really work on PowerShell that much. I am kind of our guy for SSH and remoting. Uh, so today, I am going, once it shows up. We got Wi-Fi and projectors, so if anybody has a printer we can hook up, we'll have the trilogy. I know, we're good. <laughs> awesome. Right, so today, uh, I'm going to connect to this machine. I'm standing over here for a reason because I'm gonna go and create a file on that machine without touching that machine from my phone. So I have a PowerShell prompt open from Azure Cloud Shell on my phone. You can see people in the front row that I do have PowerShell open on my phone. There's no funny business going on. And so from my phone, I'm going to SSH into this box. Uh, right now we're on a Windows Server 2025 machine. Uh, SSH ships installed by default on Windows Server 2025. And we're also going to use uh, Azure Arc and SSH connectivity for Azure Arc. I know I've talked about two, two different Azure things here, whether it be Azure Cloud Shell or Azure Arc. Both of those are free. So not any of, anything I'm going to show you right now isn't being charged for. So even if I've, oh, I have to, I timed out, so give me a second. Well, while you're looking at that, um, I can really quick show for everybody who has seen, wow, that's really small. <laughs> This text says remote SSH access. So you may have tried SSH in Windows before. Mm -hmm. Just to be super clear, WinRM, great tool. As we move more and more towards cloud technologies, we think SSH for Windows is gonna be a more agnostic way to move forward. A lot more machines are in standalone, so that means with WinRM, you've all got like the trusted host issues. If you're not in a domain and things like that, SSH helps us get away from this and start moving towards using the same set of tools cross-platform. So we really want to make this easy, and it has been hard to use yeah. Win32 OpenSH in Windows. Starting in 2025, it's in the box. It's one-click enablement. So the, we followed exactly the same mod, uh, model as remote desktop. So it's in there, it's turned on by default, but the service is disabled, the firewall port's closed. When you click enabled, it becomes available on private network, and then you can control using policy how you want to actually manage it. And we say one click, but you can really just do like a start service dash SSHD, yeah. and that's the PowerShell to do it. So it's a, Thank you. A, no clicks. A one, one command. Nobody click. So, okay. So I have Cloud Shell open on my phone. I'm going to run my SSH connection to this machine. We're going to hope that the conference Wi-Fi holds up. I will off to this machine. And I know you can't see this, I'm sorry, but there was no way of projecting my phone. <laughs> okay, I am now here, front row. See, I'm connected as administrator, right? <laughs> Great. Yes, I'm connected as administrator. So now I can easily go and create a file here. I run that command, and boom, there's now a file there. All from, all from my phone. Woo. That's it. If you want to know more about SSH or the, how I connected with this, uh, come to my session. It's at the end of day on Wednesday. So Damien, I'll come up next and uh, we'll talk about some new security technologies that we're working on. Uh, while he's setting up, I just wanted to point out, so you might be wondering, Oh, so he must have put his phone on conference Wi-Fi. I've got a port open, port 22, and he's connecting in. No, this is actually using a technology that relays traffic through Azure. 
So my, uh, my Hyper-V VM was ARC enabled, which means it shows up in the cloud as if it were in the cloud, but it's not, it's running on my machine. And then it has an extension running on it that is connecting to a service in Azure that relays traffic. So his client uh, authenticated him to the Azure service, let him connect through that relay, and he was able to get into the Hyper-V VM on my machine through conference Wi-Fi uh, without a direct connection. So take it away. All right. So my name is Damien, Damien Caro. I'm um, here, I'm representing the Azure Client Tools. So that means Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI. I tend to speak both languages, PowerShell and Shell, uh, try to be compatible and making sure that the two clients get together along on every innovation we're doing. Um, I'm going to start with a story that happened back in the fall of 2023. Um, <clears throat> I received an email one day in the late evening saying, hey, we need to talk about uh, security keys being leaked on GitHub uh, repos. It turned out that um, we had an internal uh, first party Microsoft uh, team that was running GitHub Actions and they were running Azure CLI as well as Azure PowerShell code. And those commands were actually exposing keys on GitHub Actions. <laughs> Fun story, you get a storage account key that's being leaked on GitHub Action on a public repo. And it turns out that logs on GitHub Actions on public repos are available to anyone. So yes, those keys were available to anyone. Storage account keys were available to anyone that could access that. So we worked on fixing that. Um, in the last few months, we actually made a couple of improvements on Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell. If you're following the updates, uh, yes, <laughs> I heard recently that we make frequent updates on Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI. Uh, but one of them that we've done is to help you identify when you have keys being exposed by your commands. So here's a command I'm going to run. It's a get easy storage account key uh, on one of the resource group I've done. And what we've done is that we've added a warning message that you can see here. Uh, of course, I'm using Azure PowerShell uh, that tells you when we detect a secret that is exposed in the output of your command. We are looking today at storage account keys, access tokens, uh, some key vault properties, and we are also looking at connection strings. We're going to expand over time in the next few months the number of resources that we're detecting. And our goal is to have maybe not 100% coverage. We have a lot of secrets that are available in Microsoft Azure, but at least an 80% kind of thing. Uh, so we know we have a very good coverage of those secrets. Now you can tell me, I don't like to have a warning message in my output. It, pollutes my logs, and I really don't want to see that. I know what I'm doing, I'm very confident. Well, that's fine. We have a config value that allows you to set this information to null or false. And in that case, we're not displaying the secret. By the way, you've seen that big yellow warning message that tells that I'm using a version of Azure AZ config that is not the latest one. That's something that is embedded today in Azure PowerShell. It tells you when you have a version that is not up to date and invites you to make the update. And if it's a breaking change, we're going to tell you when we're going to make the breaking change so you can prepare for it and update your script accordingly. Let's run the command again. And now you have the key without the warning message. So you have full control of that being, um, being displayed or not. That's the demo around uh, secrets and config. Uh, we have more information on this. This is actually today disabled by default. So we're not throwing a warning, but at build, so in, in a month or so from now, we're planning to have it enabled by default. And in that case, you would have to disable it if you don't want to have any, any warning messages. Uh, we can talk more about that on Wednesday. I think we have a session at one o'clock or two o'clock. I don't remember exactly, but around the afternoon, early afternoon, and we can talk about identity improvement that we're making as well. Um, that's, uh, that's the update on the Azure Client Tools. Thank you. Yep. All right, I'm gonna move quickly through these next two slides because we've got one more person we wanna bring up. <clears throat> um, first, I wanted to share, I've mentioned several times, say there's sessions this week that go into deeper dives on these. Um, so I just wanted to point out exactly what I was talking about, and um, you can obviously pull them up on the schedule, but uh, there are focus groups this week for us to get feedback from you. 
One is on using secrets in PowerShell. So take what Damien was just talking about. One of the things we're trying to build a muscle around is, can we go experiment with something in the Azure PowerShell module? And if it turns out it's the right thing to do, fold that back into the language. So if this concept of secret detection, secret obfuscation, stuff like that is of interest to you, that would be a really good focus group to come tell us what you need. Um, Tuesday, there, or that's today. <laughs> well, there will also be a session on logging. Sydney's leading that one. And then uh, on Wednesday, I think Stephen has the session on um, getting PowerShell 7 into Windows and what you need. Uh, any special requirements, things like that. And then we do have deep dive sessions. Uh, I've got one today on DSC v3, um, the enhancements on interactive enhancements. Uh, a lot of that will get into more of the AI type of work. Um, deep dive on Azure PowerShell on Wednesday. Uh, the SSH session is on Wednesday. And then Thursday, the last day, we have sessions on Cloud Shell and then on private galleries. So I was wrong before, the private galleries thing's not later today, it's Thursday. So what does our next year look like? Um, we're just going to focus on themes, and then I want to hand it off to Vlad. So by far, biggest investment going to 7.5 was we're going to focus on security. We've got all kinds of things that we're working on that you've seen some of them here. Um, a lot of times we're just looking at e even things like the ACR work is very security focused. It's trying to solve uh, secure supply chain artifacts. So a lot of the work we're doing is focusing on security and IT operations. Uh, remote operations refers to SSH. We want to take that farther than we ever took WinRM and actually start focusing on scenarios, not just the underlying platform. Um, intelligent shell is the, is the term that we use as a team to refer to basically anything related to suggestions, predictors, AI, you name it. So Steven's doing a great job driving a lot of work there. Uh, we 100% will continue investing in community. So we want to keep working on uh, you know, PowerShell slash PowerShell and GitHub together with you and across all the different modules and projects, taking your issues, taking your PRs, and continuing to engage there. And then uh, I do have a session later today on DSC, but we're reinvesting big time into DSC. And that's, uh, there's lots of details I could get into there, but it's a, a session all of its own. So for our last presenter, uh, I'm gonna introduce my boss, Vlad. Um, Vlad has been at Microsoft for 25 years. You might know some of the technologies he's previously worked on. Vlad worked on WMI. Vlad worked on System Center Operations Manager. In fact, Vlad worked on MOM, the precursor to SCOM. Uh, so many of you probably have been around long enough to remember that. Um, he then moved over to App Insights. Uh, he drove Azure Portal for storage, compute, and networking for years. Uh, Vlad is an all-around really great guy to talk to. So if you get time this week, pull him aside and just learn about his career and, and how he's grown. That's actually where we're going to ask him to focus his time with you today is what skills he's seeing develop. Um, and just to give you an idea about what's on his plate uh, across his org, all of these things. So the core Azure engine, building out ARM templates, writing BICEP files. Uh, that also tells you a little bit about where PowerShell sits at Microsoft and what we're part of. And this last part, I wanted to explain the image. And this tells you a little bit about how great Vlad is at sharing his knowledge. Um, you can imagine across a big org, lots of younger people, first time homeowners and you know, renters and things like that. He did a Teams call and taught people how to hang a shelf. And it was the coolest thing. And tons of people joined. And he built a little false wall and he literally turned it around and said, look, there's boards behind the drywall. You're gonna wanna find these. And it was the greatest thing ever. And that gives you a little bit uh, of insight about his culture and what he's like. So I'll hand it off. Awesome. Th thank you, Michael. It was part of our give giving campaign at Microsoft. We do a once a year giving campaign. So you had to donate to the Habitat for Humanity to, to sort of join. But yeah, uh, I've been at Microsoft for 25 years and I sort of like to talk about my year there or my years there are sort of as two chapters. The first chapter was uh, sort of building what we uh, which today refer to as box products or on-prem products. And uh, as you remember back in those days, I started a Windows 2000 specifically on the WMI service within Windows that was trying to make Windows the most manageable OS, both sort of locally, remotely, clients and servers, uh, and really abstract all of the different things that, that would be exposed through Windows so you can access them in a common way, script them in a common way. Uh, and got to work with Je Jeffrey uh, closely when when he started uh, PowerShell back, back in sort of the 2000 uh, timeframe when we were still working on this console in WMI called Wimic. Uh, but, but back then it was about building products in three year cycles. You know, they were slow. We, 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 we had 
year to test the product, a year to develop the product. And PMs were very often working on sort of requirements for the product sort of, you know, six years down the road that customers would often take even longer to adopt because of how long it took. Uh, that was my first chapter where I learned how to become a PM, learned, learned how to talk to customers, learned how to work with, uh, work with development. In the second chapter, uh, sort of the chap chapter that we're in now is, is really all around services, uh, building services, uh, scaling services, running services. If, if you think about Microsoft in, in my first chapter, it was, uh, it was really building software that we would put on a CD and then it was your problem to install and maintain and run. Uh, and, and you would call 1-800-MICROSOFT if, if there was an issue. Uh, but we often didn't run the software. You know, there, there definitely were instances where we would run the software, but, but we didn't run it. You were the experts, our partners were the experts. Uh, and, and a lot of times, you know, it worked on our machines and, and you know, it was maybe your problem. Uh, you know, was, did you install it on the right hardware or all those sort of uh, issues, whereas now, with Azure and all the services we're running, it obviously is our problem. We have to update it and maintain it and, and, insta and, and install it, and you just get to use it. Uh, and, and I really feel like in, in that transition, uh, sort of as a, as a product manager at Microsoft that, uh, that remember we had like three years to build a product and like we spent six months accessibility testing it, where now in this sort of new world, we're moving so fast and so quickly that we have to make sure that every single check-in is accessibility tested uh, because of how fast we're, we're, we're updating and going. And in sort of a terms of evolution, I feel like as a PM who, you know, maybe in the on-prem product days used to sort of be able to extract oxygen out of the air with lungs, I feel like I've now sort of become a fish and swam from both fresh water and salt water and able to extract lungs with sort of gills. That's how sort of big the changes I've seen uh, from this on-prem product days to uh, to sort of the service this day. So I sort of wanted to extend that to just some of the things that we're seeing in the cloud scaling uh, side. We're seeing this tremendous need for cloud skills and 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 I'm trying I, I wanted to try to talk about some of the ways that I think the skills that you've you've maybe b developed on-prem uh, in in the sort of data center work is transferable to the cloud. So uh, as you think about sort of data centers to the cloud, how, how many people here are still managing servers that are in an active directory environment? Uh, lots of people. Now keep your hands up. How, how many people are managing those servers with Configuration Manager? Keep keep your hand up. Put your hand down if you're not. Oh, so there's still still a few, but but lots lots of hands came down. That's great. Uh, obviously, that was a key way to to sort of give servers the ability to be part of a group, to be managed, to be an OU, so that you can then leverage uh, group policy objects to target them and really configure and govern them. Uh, in the cloud cloud world, we're transitioning these to sort of be managed by cloud accounts and cloud subscriptions and different ways to access those subscriptions. Or in specifically in the Azure side, we have these things called management groups, and those are part of a tenant. And then management groups can contain subscriptions, and subscriptions contain resource groups. And there can be a whole layer of what the management groups are. Uh, and we have have the ability to apply policy and governance on on all of these. And it's not just virtual machines that we're targeting, uh, it's any of these plethora of resources from Cosmos databases that Abby talked about to storage accounts that Damien just showed. And uh, I, I do wanna know if anyone hacked Damien's account. Uh, uh, he, he showed the keys up there for a while. Did anyone put, put, put files up there yet? Maybe, maybe, maybe Danny. Danny did, he'll hopefully reset the keys pretty soon. Uh, but, but, but there's a lot of control that we have in the cloud, uh, and we're trying to give you the same ability to control uh, things from, from on-prem uh, in the cloud. So for specifically on the config manager side, uh, we are working closely with the config manager team and the Intune team because clients, the client devices are, are moving to Intune, uh, but the servers we're working on connecting to Azure through Arc so that you can manage them and govern them and uh, still leverage all of the machine ability to configure the configuration of them uh, through DSC and machine config. Uh, but but this whole whole sort of uh, sort of private to public uh, so, sort of things is 
as uh, as Danny showed, ability to, to sort of put a file on a VM that's running on on Michael's uh, Michael's laptop is is just incredible connectivity. Where where now from what we can do with Teams and all of the things that that we can do. When when I started at Microsoft, uh, it's it's almost embarrassing to to sort of tell some of the new hires at Microsoft that. First off, they weren't born when I started, but uh, we didn't even have Wi-Fi in the offices. If if you remember back in those days, when you know you have to in between meetings, you would run and connect and 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 sort of uh, connect your email and stuff. And now, you know, we're we're on Teams messages, folding laundry, uh, or, or or driving. It's incredible. But when the public cloud started, we we really said everything would be sort of public, publicly accessible. But more and more. Uh, with na nation state attacks and a lot of different controls that customers are looking for, even things that are in the public cloud, we're trying to sort of privately expose and try to have sort of more control so that even if it is running in, in Azure in, in a public environment, it's connected to your VNet and, and only connected to your VNet or only connected to your users that are logging into Entra, uh, but are coming from your, your, your sort of scoped IP addresses. So. Uh, sort of lots of ways to, to, to sort of leverage your skills there. Uh, the, the other sort of interesting thing when I joined Microsoft was uh, every, every, first off, we had offices. Now we have sort of more team spaces. But, but back in every office, there was sort of a set of network plugs that you could connect to the, internet, uh, connect to, to the sort of local, local network. And you could protect, you could apply for sort of a DTAP, which was sort of directly connected to the internet. Uh, and in those cases, you know, you had to basically sign away your firstborn in the form to sort of get one of these connections, because uh, there's lots, lots of damage you can do. Uh, whereas now with Azure script subscriptions, everyone in the company can 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 sort of create something that's directly connected to the internet, uh, which which is which which is si similarly sort of. Uh, incredibly, uh, incredibly open compared to sort of how things uh, how things were. Uh, on the automation side, as, as uh, clearly we've invested in in repeatable automated uh, uh, ways to uh, allow you to configure users, configure servers, configure uh, your applications to run on these servers. Uh, we're we're working on ways to leverage uh, uh, sort of this continuum to get to. Uh, sort of not just imperative code, but sort of declarative code with DSC, uh, and then some of the the different cloud mechanisms like Bicep or, or Terraform. Uh, how many P users here are familiar with with uh, use Terraform regularly? Good number of Terraform uh, Bicep. Bicep users, good good number of bicep users. Um, on the GitHub side, you talk, heard, heard Abby talk about how many new users are, are new to GitHub in, in 2023, which is incredible incredible to hear. Uh, and and just all of the code base practices to to check in things, to to be able to review, pull pull, do different pull requests, and and see what's uh, uh, see what your teams are leveraging. On on the security side. Uh, it is incredible to see what's been happening with nation state attacks and just recently with uh, the XZ attack that happened in the public uh, in, in, in front of everyone on, on the SSH side. It's just incredible, incredible to see how, uh, how, how vigilant we need to be in, our, in protecting our own systems, protecting our own data. Uh, what was the hack? I think it was just just yesterday. I think Home Depot had another hack. Uh, a bunch of internal uh, user accounts were, were sort of leaked and, and shared. Uh, the security is obviously a continuum. Uh, we, we've gone through numbers of rounds of sort of trustworthy computing, if you remember at Microsoft, with uh, sort of some of the challenges that we had early in the Windows days when sort of things were defaulted to be open, and then we sort of defaulted things to be closed uh, uh, as more and more things were connected. We're going through the same round uh, in, in the cloud days, uh, in, in the cloud, where uh, we're looking at more ways to have, have uh, accounts and resources be created in a way that is uh, locked by default and not, not internet exposed and private linked and having better things with keys, just as you heard Damien talk about the ways that we're trying to make sure keys, uh, uh, keys aren't available in GitHub, uh, in GitHub logs. Uh, and then on the, uh, the, the on cost side, cost is definitely an interesting challenge as things have moved from sort of capital expenditure, you know, your data centers to, to sort of being able to rent resources, uh, rent users, uh, rent, rent different uh, sort of where you're paying per, fit, per minute. Uh, obviously, costs there are more important to sort of watch. What can you save? How can you sort of turn off things? We didn't maybe have to do that in our own data centers because we were 
you know, over provisioned and, and sort of available and we couldn't sort of dynamically scale up or down. Uh, now with the cloud, we have the ability to really sort of scale down at night, scale down in the morning and, and really auto scale. So you can save, uh, you can save money and you can save, uh, save costs. Uh, Abby talked about the importance of data and how, how, how data is important. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, given e even my own sort of two sort of chapters at Microsoft in the first chapter, we had no data. You know, except maybe crash Watson data, dump data that we had when when th those started being appeared, we really didn't know what users were doing other than you know we had the number of support cases coming in and we had you know maybe sort of crash dump analysis back in in those days. Whereas now with the cloud and now with our online services, we have a tremendous amount of data. We almost have too much data where it's hard to understand sort of what to do with this data, how to leverage this data, and obviously AI can leverage uh, this data a lot more than than sort of uh, us from the sort of human side can do, uh, and 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 leverage uh, sort of lots of things for for solving some of the generative AI uh, AI problems. Uh, incident and problem management are still, you know, very, very important skills and uh, skills and, and tasks that we're seeing uh, uh, continue to be important. Uh, and then, and then, as as every company is becoming a software company, uh, you know, if you think about a bath scale manufacturer that, you know, back in back in uh, in in the, in the early days, they didn't have to. Uh, they, they didn't have any software as sort of part of that. There was no sort of consuming facing software that was a bath scale. You stood on it, it told you your weight and you were all done. Whereas now even bath scale companies have apps automatically sending that data to the cloud, sharing it, giving you sort of different aspects of helping you improve your uh, sort of lifestyle so you can achieve your goal. Obviously that data needs to be secured. All of those apps need to be updated. Uh, just an incredible amount of, of uh, of sort of changes where every company is now a software company and we're seeing the same sort of IT uh, sort of skills and, and IT sort of practices, even transferring into what, what people refer to as OT or operations technology or sort of manufacturing plants, uh, different, uh, different uh, branch offices, different devices, uh, diff different systems that are interacting. How do these OT systems start to be managed by sort of IT practices? Uh, as they are connected uh, to the cloud, as they're sort of automatically being able to be updated. <clears throat> Some incredible uh, capabilities that, that we in this room have uh, to take the, all of the things that we've done from the IT side, from managing thousands of Windows servers, thousands of Windows clients, to being able to do the same for different uh, IoT scenarios, where now more and more devices are going to be connected from elevators to, uh, to, to different manufacturing plants. Uh, we, I was on a call this morning where uh, some of the major uh, soda manufacturers are, are producing machines that are in uh, different, different machines, uh, different buildings, so you can sort of choose your, your, uh, your soda recipe or, or sort of make your own drink. Uh, we have a ton of these on the Microsoft campus. All of these are connected. All of these have to be updated. Uh, and it's, we're seeing that happen across all of the different, uh, all of the different uh, uh, industries from, from retail to healthcare. And, and obviously uh, that data needs to be secured and, and we don't want those, those, uh, those systems hacked. So yeah, lot, <clears throat> lots of ways to leverage your, uh, your IT skills, all your, all your automation skills uh, in the future. And uh, yeah, Gart Gartner is definitely seeing uh, organizations struggling to find, uh, to find the skilled work to be able to, to some sort of manage, manage this transition, uh, move resources from, from on-prem, from data centers to the cloud, uh, leveraging sort of both new apps for, for sort of dy dynamic uh, sort of uh, uh, as, as Gartner calls them, sort of uh, mode two applications, so sort of things that are uh, connected to users and sort of dynamically updated. So yeah, I wanted to share a bit of these and yeah, I'll be around uh, the rest of today and, and tomorrow afternoon if you want to chat and thank, thank you very much for your time.